many years ago, I was uh, on a plane to Austin, Texas. And I was actually going to Austin because I was going to be taking up my first job as a faculty member at the University of Texas at Austin. So I was pretty excited. And so this plane is kind of coming in to land, and I'm looking out of the window, and I could see these kind of blue and green sparkly things on the ground. I mean, I, I didn't know what they were. Some of them were kind of diamond-shaped, and some of them are kind of round. And I'm kind of looking out, and then as the plane kind of came closer, um, I realized that they were swimming pools. <laughs> I was amazed. I, I, I grew up in New Delhi, and I love swimming. And so, you know, I would often go swimming on a hot summer's day, and there were many of those. Um, but I'd never been in a swimming pool where there weren't at least 50 other people in the pool. <laughs> so, but what does this tell you about how these people interact? To me, it felt a bit insular, a bit divided. And, you know, just a few weeks ago, I was talking to a dear friend and co-author of mine, Elizabeth Teisberg, and I shared this memory with her. And she told me something about her childhood. She grew up in the Midwest and um, on a um, sort of a neighborhood block, something like that. But here's the difference. On Elizabeth's block, there were no fences. So imagine what that would feel like. So instead of having you know, one or two bored kids trying to play in each yard, you might have seven or eight kids running around and you know, swinging on the swing set because there's space for one, and maybe one parent keeping an eye out. Totally different kind of interaction. Elizabeth and I have spent many years uh, studying very, very innovative service organizations, trying to understand what makes them innovative. And um, we found that something pretty fundamental to many of these um, organizations is the way in which they interact, whether it's with their clients, with their customers, or even with other organizations. And I mean, just think about it. Interaction is pretty fundamental to what we do all the time as human beings. You know, we're interacting all the time. The moment you open your mouth, you're interacting with your family, with your uh, friends, with your colleagues, uh, with the guy down the street. But we don't think about it because, you know, the, the sort of how should you interact is just so ingrained that you just do it. But what if we were to rethink our interactions? Could we get more out of them if we did that? One of the pretty fundamental things about interaction is just how many people, and there are a lot of people here, how many people are you interacting with at any uh, one point in time, right? So uh, think back to uh, the last time you had to see a doctor. So you, you uh, call the doctor and you know, get an appointment, show up, and you're waiting in the lobby, and then your name shows up, or they call your name, maybe they mispronounce your name, and, and then you go uh, to see the doctor, right? Pretty standard. So when I was um, teaching at the University of Virginia, and Elizabeth uh, was my colleague there, she introduced me to uh, Dr. Amy Tucker, who is a cardiologist. And um, Amy was running this preventive cardiac care clinic um, at Virginia. Now, you'd never go to Amy's clinic if you were actually having a heart attack. Uh, but uh, you would go there if you had some of the risk factors for heart disease, so if you had previously had a heart attack, or um, if you um, were um, overweight. And um, so Amy had basically decided that she wanted to change um, the way she had always interacted with her patients. And so if you called Amy's clinic, you'd get probably an assistant, and the assistant would say, yeah, sure, you know, you can get an appointment with Amy, but you'll probably have to wait for uh, four weeks, five weeks for your appointment, or you can come tomorrow for a shared medical appointment. So here's how uh, this was going to work. That's her clinic. Uh, so essentially, you'd be in there, instead of having a one-on-one -on -one half hour appointment, you would be in there with probably six to 10 others and with Amy. But she would actually not be giving you a lecture. She would um, do a one-on-one -on -one diagnose and prescribe with you and then move on to the next patient. Um, but there's a bunch of other patients listening. 
So obviously, this is pretty efficient for the doctor, right? She doesn't have to keep repeating the same thing again and again. Um, and um, she can actually deal with 10 patients in the time that otherwise she would have done three patients. But if you think, is this in any way better for the patient? And so here's what Amy found. She found that when she started doing these shared medical appointments, the patient satisfaction measures, they just went through the roof. Uh, and also, uh, she found that for the ones who had been going to the shared appointments, when she looked at the extent to which uh, there was weight loss over time, that they were shedding weight, there was greater weight loss, significantly greater, for those who were in the shared appointments versus the regular one-on-one -on -one appointment. Uh, so when we um, saw these results, we were super excited. Our heads were just sort of swimming with questions. Because first of all, why? There was no new science in her clinic, so why were her patients so much better off? And then the second thing we started thinking is, hey, if this can work in healthcare, and healthcare is a sort of touchy-feely, very personal sort of uh, interaction, where else could this work? And we also started to think, are there other things that you could tweak about an interaction from which you can get massive results? And uh, you know what we did is, in fact, the three of us, Amy and Elizabeth and I, we spent four years studying these questions. And we published uh, an article in the Harvard Business Review that describes some of what we found. So one thing is, we found that uh, part of the reason why um, her patients were um, better off was that when she was uh, sharing information with any one patient, that was actually really relevant to the others because they, they weren't really a random collection. They were all people with similar problems. And so they could also learn from each other. And I was uh, just sharing this concept with Saul Klein some time ago. Saul is a partner at Index Ventures. And he had this really interesting reaction. He says, uh, you know, we invest a lot of money in startups, but we also spend plenty of time mentoring and advising these companies. So he's now thinking that he might bring together a few similar, like tech startups, and do a shared mentoring type of interaction. So you're probably sitting there thinking, well, that's great, but what's in it for you? Or, you know, what's in it for me? I'm not a venture capitalist. And uh, I also don't have any heart issues. Maybe that's why I don't have any heart issues. <laughs> but I actually eat pretty healthy. And you know, uh, some time ago, my younger son and I were eating dinner together. He was 10. And uh, you, know, you can tell I'm Indian. So we were eating dal and rice for dinner. And after dinner, we uh, were just hanging out in the kitchen. And he helps himself to a couple of cookies. And so I was actually still a bit hungry, so I took another cup of dal, lentils. Um, and then I asked my son, I said, hey, you, you've taken two cookies for dessert, and I've taken dal for dessert, so who's going to live to be 105? So he says, I am. So I say, how come? He says, better health care. <laughs> At any rate, uh, we're doing some renovation on our house, and we've hired an electrician. And um, I discovered only a few days ago, there's actually three other houses on our street, actually on our same block, that are also doing, being renovated. And the reason I know this is because I found somebody else's construction rubbish in our dumpster. And um, then I started to think, what if we'd all hired the same electrician? You know, so then if he wanted to move around, he wouldn't have to deal with London traffic. And I would also know about his performance from people I'm already networked with. Very different kind of interaction. But you know, usually when you call an electrician, the reason you're doing that is because you want to get something done. And in fact, when you call any service provider, you either want to get something done or or you want to achieve something. So for instance, you, know, you want to manage your money, so you go to a bank. Or you want your kids to have uh, different opportunities, you send them to a school. So we like to think of the boundary of any service provider as the stuff that they do to help you get what you want done versus what other service providers might do 
and also what you yourself need to do. So for instance, you go to the doctor and they you know, advise and prescribe some medicines, but you do need to go somewhere else to get those medicines, and then you yourself have to take those medicines. So there's clearly some boundaries. I was talking um, some time ago to uh, Scott Cook uh, about this idea of boundaries. Scott is the founder of Intuit. Intuit is a market-leading uh, tax uh, software company in the US, and Scott shared this really fascinating um, story with me. Um, so they sell this tax software. And I don't know about you guys, but when, when I'm doing my taxes, I usually have a lot of questions. And so these people buy their um, software, and then they're calling them, and they have these sort of expert um, tax advisors who answer people's questions. And so Scott said that there were these two employees, I think somewhere in California, at Intuit, and they said, look, we're getting all these questions, and it's really costing us time and money to answer them, and we're in the internet age. So why don't we just have our customers all answer each other's questions? Yeah, they were laughed out of the room. But they wouldn't give up. So these two guys uh, decided, somehow they managed to do a survey, and they survey hundreds of customers, and then all the feedback comes back. 99%, I think, of their customers said, no way. We do not want other customers to answer our questions. You can go to jail if you haven't done your uh, taxes right. But they still didn't give up. They somehow managed to get permission to uh, try out this idea in this really small market where there was no chance of kind of uh, contaminating the bigger uh, brand of Intuit. And guess what? Huge success. So they now have um, TurboTax Community Live, where you can see it's a totally different um, thought about how that boundary works. Another very fundamental aspect of our interactions, and something that we rarely question, is just where are you interacting? She's a slum dweller. What do you think is the likelihood that this woman would be banking at the same retail bank that you or I are banking at? Not very high. This is the same realization that struck Stuart Rutherford. Um, he's actually a British architect. And he said, if she's not going to go to the bank, let's take the bank to the slum. And um, so what they did is they um, went to Bangladesh and they trained up, in fact, women slum dwellers. Uh, and they gave them these little handheld devices. This is way before mobile money and all of this, about 15 years ago. And they would go door to door. And um, you could do a transaction as small as a taka, which is a small fraction of a penny. And it's about changing the location. In fact, what Manan talked about, the healthcare example, or Dame Shirley, I mean, those are, again, fantastic examples of where you question the location of where an interaction should take place. Something that uh, we found uh, is that uh, the kinds of uh, organizations that are getting the most out of their interactions are the ones that have actually changed more than one thing at once about uh, their interactions. So if you think about um, Amy's clinic, uh, yes, she went from one-on-one -on -one to one-on-many, -on -many, and she also changed the boundary because the support group actually came into the doctor's office with what she did. Some of you might um, resonate with uh, parent-teacher meetings. Those of you who have kids, I'm sure all your parents went to uh, parent-teacher meetings. You know, it's the usual, you're sitting out in the corridor anxiously examining the frayed carpet and then waiting for your turn to, to go in uh, to talk to the teacher. Um, it happens like this all over the world. Uh, my son's uh, school, they seem to have uh, decided to try out a different model. So when we went uh, recently for a parent-teacher meeting, um, it wasn't like this. We, it was in a big hall, and there were basically the teachers, all the subject teachers were standing around, and all the parents are milling around all over the hall. They had wine and cheese, which always helps, and uh, the, the, the uh, class teachers were on the side, so you did have to queue up uh, to meet the class teacher, but otherwise, it's a totally different kind of interaction. If you think about it, they've changed the location, so instead of being in classrooms, you're standing in the hall. 
Um, it's not quite one-on-one -on -one because there are other uh, people nearby, so you might not want to say something too private. Um, and the boundaries changed. So uh, rather than just providing an opportunity for you to meet your um, kid's teacher, the school is also allowing you to interact with um, other parents. And as working parents, you know, for us, that two-minute conversation with uh, a mom or dad of one of our boys' parents is super valuable. So it's a change in the boundary as well. What I'd like to leave you with is this thought. Can you change the way in which you interact? Could you take something that you usually do in a group, for example, maybe in um, a coffee house, referring back to the last talk, you know, you meet people in a coffee house, would you want to take that to one-on-one? -on -one? Or can you shift the boundary on um, something that you do regularly? Or could you just change the location of an interaction? If you start to challenge these aspects of your interactions, innovation can begin. Thank you.